Well, I, my computer's off completely, so um, I'm depending on the sound, but it's just way loud. Mm. Chairman, you may proceed. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I would like to call this special <coughs> meeting of the Rehoboth Beach Planning Commission to order. Uh, today is January 5th at 10 a.m. Will the secretary please call the roll? Commissioner Covington? Here. Dewey? Commissioner Dewey? Here. Ellison? Here. Commissioner Ellison? He's muted. Here. Okay, good. Okay. Commissioner Hunter? Here. Commissioner Kaufman? Good morning. Here. Commissioner Macha? Here. Commissioner Strange? Here. Commissioner Bryan? Here. And Commissioner Davis? Here. All right. The meeting is now in order at approximately 10.01 a.m. Uh, I'd like to be able to conclude our business today at the sooner of the, the finish of our discussion or 1230, which happens, whichever comes first. Um, as a matter of uh, just housekeeping, I'd like to introduce to the commission, Luke Matta. He is here as he's a uh, member of the law firm of Armstrong Teasdale, a national firm. The city has retained Mr. Meta as a counsel for the planning commission, and I welcome him and, and encourage all of you to get to, to meet him and get to know him. Good morning. I look forward to working with you. At this point, uh, we are today again consider, uh, continuing our consideration of the, I guess what we're up to now is draft three of the CDP. And we have with us today, Lauren Good of Wallace Montgomery. And Lauren, if you are available, can you start us through the process? Muted. You're muted, Lauren. Is that better? Yes. Perfect, sorry about that, thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, all of you should have received a, uh, a memo that outlines uh, what we are going to be discussing today, uh, but um, we wanted to pick up the discussion on uh, land use and annexation where we left it during the last meeting um, and then uh, go on to some additional uh, items as noted in that memo. Um, so uh, to begin with, um, I will uh, share my screen, um, if you'll bear with me for one moment here. Okay. Uh, and I will, uh, this is a uh, showing the, uh, the future land use map um, as uh, it was presented uh, previously. Uh, this and the uh, annexation growth area maps are two of the maps that we uh, are looking to have in the CDP. Uh, and while we discussed these uh, more generally last time, I, I wanted to circle back to this discussion uh, to see if there were any comments on uh, any revisions that you would like to see uh, to, this, uh, to this map itself. Um, as you'll recall, we, th this, map itself, uh, the data for it was actually generated by the prior planning consultant, um, and their suggestion was to um, uh, note the future land uses in a more generalized format. So that's why here you have um, commercial and residential, um, and then those um, do relate but are not the same as uh, the uh, the zoning districts, um, and that is uh, uh, that correlation is shown in a table that we had uh, discussed last time. Uh, so with that, I wanted to open up the discussion to see if anyone had any comments about this or if you wanted to see any changes to this. Um, I can either keep this map up, zoom into areas, or uh, turn it back to the videos of the commission members based on your preference. 
Laura, does this uh, exhibit reflect current zoning? Uh, I yes, I, I believe it does. It is the um, it it was based on the uh, the official zoning map, uh, but generalizing those classifications. Uh, so, for example, um, all of the commercial zoning districts uh, uh, are represented here by just the general future uh, general uh, commercial future land use. Okay, so you're not breaking commercial down to C1, C2, or th C3. It's just commercial. Correct. Okay. Um, and that's and the same with residential. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Mike, I do have a comment if I could give it. Yes, sir. Um, chapter four in the language says that you specifically have to show uh, future uh, uh, future zones uh, on your future zoning maps three and four. Uh, if you don't do that. Um, and you come up with a new zone, you go back and amend the CDP. So right. my suggestion is, is that we put some sort of a note on these maps that indicate, uh, because in the document, we do recommend that we consider a future mixed use uh, mat, uh, mixed uses in the commercial zones and maybe even in a residential. I think we need to put something on these maps that indicate that if that's adopted, if we if the uh, commissioners create a new zone, um, th where the potential areas in the future it could be applied. Otherwise, every time you want to rezone something or you try to rezone something, you'd have to have a comprehensive development plan amendment. So we need to we need to make sure that we identify areas, maybe for example, in the boardwalk or uh, Wilmington and Baltimore Avenue where potential future uses could be applied. Um, so it's very specific. It does say, you know, unless you zone everything in accordance with the CDP, you have to go back and amend the CDP. So I'm not sure, uh, Lauren, how to, you know, how to uh, correct this, but I think we need something that indicates there could be such rezonings in the future should the city adopt a uh, mixed use zone. I could, I like just to, add I like one, to... could I just add one point of uh, clarification or correction? My understanding, Steve, uh, is that we have not recommended uh, even consideration of mixed use in areas that are currently zoned residential. I think the, the CDP is pretty clear throughout that we do support consideration of mixed use in areas that are currently zoned commercial. So with that um, uh, addendum um, or correction or whatever you want to call it, um, I agree with Steve that uh, we need to, to think about uh, how we can avoid uh, putting the city in the position of having to redo the CDP. And I'll um, respond to that point. Uh, the future land use map and the zoning map are obviously two different things. Um, the table that uh, it's a uh, table four dash uh, four dash one um, in the in the uh, uh, draft number three shows um, on the left hand side the existing city zoning classifications and then on the right hand side the uh, future land use classifications as shown on this map. So, for example, um, all uh, the C1, C2 and C3 zoning districts are shown as being compatible with the commercial future land use. So if the, uh, when the, the zoning regulations are updated to reflect a new mixed use district that is allowable in a commercial zone, this already does, this already would allow that um, because it, it's a, it's noted that it, it's a commercial future land use. Um, so we can clarify uh, within that section that um, again, uh, the mixed use, uh, any potential mixed use zone that might be developed would be compatible with that commercial future land use, um, but they're not one, they're not um, one in the same. So um, I, Personally, I don't think that it would be necessary to, um, you know, make that 
make that additional distinction as far as the future land use map or um, uh, something of that nature. It already reflects that, um, that purpose um, with how the state would handle any, uh, any rezoning uh, requests. Lauren, could you, uh, could you restate uh, the exact uh, table that you referred it, to? Yes, Which one it's it was? Uh, table 4-1 and in okay. the clean uh, non-track changes version of the draft, it's uh, shown on page 4-6. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. So, uh, I, don't know if I, 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 I understand what you're saying, but I do think you need some kind of language that says exactly what you just said uh, in chapter four um, to make it clear. Because when I read the chapter and I looked at the maps, I didn't come away with that. Uh, what I came away with is it's unclear. So I would suggest that we make some kind of language addition that that just says what you just said. And, and Nan, uh, I don't disagree with what you said about residential, although there, is, there are some comments about potential residential mixed use in the future. It doesn't recommend it, uh, but there are some comments in the document, but I don't have a problem with just uh, retaining this idea for just the commercial areas. Okay. I definitely think we need some language that clarifies things. So. Um, I, I'd like to raise an additional point. I understand that so long as the broadly defined uses, commercial, residential, educational, school use, and so forth, don't change, that this map has, is, collapses the zones, if you will. And we're, we're not worrying about on this map, whether it's C1, C2, or C3, R1, or R2, so forth. But there was language, is language in the 2010 CDP noting that there were certain parcels within the city of land that are zoned are zoned commercial that are adjacent to or abut residential uses. And one of the action items in the 2010 CDP was to rezone those parcels to residential from commercial. That has, was never done, um, but that's an outstanding item from the prior CDP. Now, if I understand what Lauren is saying, a change from residential to commercial or from commercial to residential would have to be shown on this map because it's a change of use rather than just a change in zoning or zoning category, commercial versus residential. We can go back to uh, the 2010 CDP and um, uh, identify those properties um, and we can make those changes to this map. Uh, so those were the 2010 CDP proposed a future uh, zoning change. We can um, uh, switch those properties to um, uh, reflect the correct or that intended uh, future land use on this map. But I don't know that, there, that the 2010 CDP identified particular properties this was an action item that, that it, but it, it does say affirmatively or categorically, the city will rezone the, some of the properties uh, from uh, commercial to residential, but I, I can't remember, but I don't believe that the uh, individual properties uh, were identified. And, well, but before we go back and try to bring something forward from the 2000 CDP, I, I think that's something that we should probably look at and review because I don't think that intent here is to bring things that weren't done right into the CDP. I think this is us to look forward and determine if that's something that we should consider or not, right? It, it would be at your discretion whether you, um, as the Planning Commission, still wanted to see that, uh, that change happen in the future. Yeah, but if there wasn't, to, um, to Julie's point, if there wasn't anything outlined or specifically cited, I'm not sure what, what was intended, right, from that 2010 CDP. Excuse me, do we have a reference to the 2010 where that language is stated? I mean, is there a page number or... Yeah, I, I can find it, um, if, if you'll just give me a minute. That'd be fine. Um, it may be uh, useful to, um, to go back and, and look at um, whether there are 
additional materials or uh, minutes or you know uh, supportive documents with regard to that particular point in the 2010 uh, CDP. Uh, it would be, I think, unfortunate if we, uh, I, 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 as I understand it, although of course this is a forward-looking document, we do at various points, uh, you know, summarize what the, you know, what the action items were from the prior CDP and have a sense of, you know, sort of what was and wasn't done. And if there are things that were left undone, I, you know, I, uh, I think we certainly should at least consider them. Yeah, Ms. Davis, is it, um, it on um, page 92 of the 2010 CDP under um, 8.322A, uh, that uh, recommendation is that in its review of the zoning code, the city will eliminate any currently permitted commercial uses or categories of use that have clear potential for adverse impacts on residential neighborhoods. Was that the reference you were referring to? I could just, get, if you'll give me a minute, I will mm -hmm. take exactly what I'm referring okay. to. I'm having trouble exiting this screen to get back into um, another screen. Really, but, while you're looking for that, may I just ask a different question just to save the time? Certainly. Okay, so on the outline, this is just perhaps for my edification. I I was a little surprised to see the green line go so far out into the ocean. And I guess I didn't realize that Rehoboth actually was responsible for that or is part of the city boundary. Is that true? That is the uh, city boundary as identified by the state. So that's what they, they have on record as the official boundary of the city. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that is um, uh, typical of some of the coastal communities that there is a, um, a portion of land um, that, that goes uh, out to that. Um, I'm unsure of the specifics to what um, actual responsibility there may be for the city um, for, for that area, um, but that's, that is what the state currently shows as the official boundary. Thank you. I think one of the references it's at the bottom of page 90 it's it's doesn't call out specific parcels but it says to achieve mixed use development most communities choose overlay districts this means underlying zoning remains in place owners choose to develop it, it goes on about a mixed use overlay that's all under the section called commercial corridors and it's it's talking about revitalization strategies uh, if you recall, there's also a redevelopment map in the 2010 CDP that outlines specific areas like Rehoboth Avenue and Wilmington and Baltimore Avenues, but it also talks about gateways um, coming into the city from different directions. So I don't, I, I haven't seen in my experience it calling out specific parcels, but I just, you know, just point out there is a map that shows that. And it talks about it in the strategies. And I think that as a planner, the way I see it, what I see one of the biggest um, ways to use a future land use map, there's, there's more than one, but when a zoning change comes up, a zoning change request to the land use, the future land use mapping for those properties and the ones adjacent to them are often evaluated in terms of what is the purpose what types of uses should be there, what's the scale, and especially the location. Um, so it's important if, if mixed use was to be in everything, everywhere that's on this future land use map for commercial, that might be appropriate, but I'm not sure that that was the intent of the discussions to my knowledge. So I, I'm just um, reflecting that and I think everybody on the planning commission has seen this in Rehoboth is when a zoning change comes up, you go back and you look at what does the CDP say in terms of policies, but also location. So uh, on that, I, I agree with what uh, Tom just said. I don't know that 
that you need to show it on all the commercial, but I think if there's specific areas, there should be some sort of a note on the map that indicates this could be appropriate for a future mixed use zone, such as Wilmington and Baltimore Avenue, and maybe some portions of Rehoboth Avenue. Um, I think we do need to identify areas where that potentially could happen. I don't think you need to do it on all your commercial areas. Um, I think some language in the in the chapter and some sort of notification notice or note on the map itself would be sufficient to cover that. I think if we I think if we uh, limit it to those three streets that ex excludes us from adding it to other commercial areas. So I think we I like your idea to begin with that in all commercial areas we'll consider the mixed use zoning. Um, back to the to the point that I raised on page ninety two, uh, there are two provisions eight point three two one city policies for commercial land uses. The city will assure that its land use plan and zoning code are drawn to avoid any negative impacts of commercial development upon residential neighborhoods. And then 8.322 city operational and enforcement actions for commercial land uses. It, this has already been cited. Uh, Subparagraph so A, in its review of the zoning code, the city will eliminate any currently permitted commercial uses of, or, or categories of use that have clear potential for adverse impacts on residential neighborhoods. Now, these, these were action items. These, this review uh, never took place, but my point is that I think I've been watching uh, planning commission at uh, meetings and agendas and so forth for long enough to know that there are uh, areas in the city that are zoned commercial that people, a number of people think or should be have been rezoned into a residential use uh, because they are immediately adjacent to or abut uh, resident single family residential uses. And that was just a loose end that was never dealt with in the, for the 2010 CDP. All this said, I'm not sure that it should be, that we should be talking about this or that we, it's appropriate for us to talk about this because we're talking in both cases about land use and zoning over which this planning commission uh, has no, no control. And maybe this is a, a agenda item that we should take up when we meet with the board of mayor and city commissioners next week, since if any review of the zoning code is going to take place and any rezoning is going to occur or any new zones be drawn, it will be uh, those will be actions that the Board of Commissioners will take rather than this Planning Commission. I think that makes a lot of sense. I, yes, this is Mike Bryan. I, I agree with that. We do have that meeting for that purpose with the Board of Commissioners. So let's, uh, Lauren, if you can put that on your to-do list uh, to make sure that is reviewed and discussed by the Board of Commissioners as well as the Planning Commission. Yeah, my, my intention in raising this this morning was not for us to take any action or make any decisions on this, but just to bookmark it as an open issue that should be addressed in this process. But I think it's more appropriate if it's addressed at least with the mayor and commissioners uh, in the same meeting and since it's in their bailiwick to have their input. Is there a consensus to do this? Anybody object? Uh, I don't object. I just think that um, you really have to distinguish between the CDP language and the and the function of the uh, board of commissioners that is the zoning body. I definitely think we should discuss this with them on the 14th. But nonetheless, you still have this issue of identifying areas uh, where if there is to be a future mixed use zone, uh, it would be appropriate. And that, that needs to be both in the language ultimately and, and, on, and, and shown somehow on the appropriate map. But I don't disagree with what uh, has just been said. Okay, if I can interrupt for just one minute, um, I see that a member of the public may have tried to call in and I just wanted to highlight that 
there will be no public comment do, during this meeting. If, I, if I've not already said that, uh, there will be no public comment during this meeting due to the compressed time and the workload that we have. Okay, continue on, Lauren, please. Okay. Um, the next item was uh, uh, regarding the annexation growth area. So the map that is shown on the screen, the area that is in uh, green is the current uh, boundary of the city. The area in the hatched orange color is the area proposed as the uh, potential uh, growth area. Uh, so for this, uh, we would again want to know if the uh, if that orangish area as shown is still uh, appropriate. Um, and uh, I, I know we've had the discussions that uh, there have not been annexations within this, in the city uh, since the last CDP, that it's likely not um, going to be uh, an issue um, or it's not something that the, uh, the city is going to proactively seek to annex properties. Uh, but um, this showing, um, any unincorporated properties on this map that the city would be uh, willing to entertain uh, an application for annexation that it that is in accordance with all of the uh, city and state requirements to do so um, that would need to be shown on uh, an, an on an annex a future annexation map um, in order for the city to even entertain that request. Uh, so this is, you know, if, if it's, if this is something that, again, you would prefer to discuss uh, at the joint meeting, uh, we can, we can certainly um, add that as well uh, to that, to that agenda. Um, but these are, these two maps are ones that, um, that we would like to get um, uh, some consensus on how to finalize them uh, before the uh, draft goes to plus. These are the two two maps that um, that they will be looking at closely. I, I would suggest that you do add that as, as a matter of discussion with the board since it is, this totally is within their purview. And unless there's anybody else have an objection to that or can we just proceed based on that consensus? Okay, Alana. All right. All right. Um, so the next thing that we wanted to um, identify um, were, or, or discuss would be um, if there are any outstanding comments uh, that you would like to bring up that we have not yet discussed. Um, the rest of this memo uh, has uh, copied uh, portions of the visions, key areas, city positions, goals, and action items that uh, we can uh, discuss um, in more in more detail um, as we get to that point, but if there are any more general items that um, that anyone feels we haven't had a chance to discuss yet that are more uh, within the, um, the the true narrative portion of the the draft itself. Um, so outside of these sections, uh, we'd like to just open it up for you to bring up any of those points um, uh, right now and have that discussion. Uh, if I may speak up, there is only one that uh, I'm not certain that we have discussed. Uh, right now, in Chapter 5 under Housing, is, is a discussion of the Architectural Design Manual. And to me, that is, is not appropriate when we're talking about housing issues. Uh, and I would like to recommend that that discussion of the Design Manual go back to chapter three under community character and profile where we have a section on community design, architectural characteristics and neighborhoods. So it's not a substantive change, Jim, it's just a, we just put it in a different position in the CDP. That's correct. Okay. Um, I have an, I have one as well. Um, no, um, Steve, before before you go there, because uh, mine's related to Jim, could we just stay with this topic for a second? Because sure. I, I flagged a couple paragraphs on page twenty two around um, the community design, and it's related to this, Jim, um, as it relates to you know the the change in how 
uh, we've seen homes come down in Rehoboth and how it's changing the community profile. And if we don't pay attention to this, you know, it's going to change the complexion of Rehoboth and its character. I, I, don't, I don't know that we all agree so much on that. And I just felt like we should revisit these three paragraphs in this narrative to just make sure we all agree what this messaging should be. Starting with, even though the city is a single resident and then the next two paragraphs on page 22. Chapter four. Chapter page 22 of what? Sorry? Which chapter? Which chapter? Chapter three. In the draft, it's page yeah. two. Draft three. In the middle okay. of the first paragraph, it says, unfortunately, a number of the city properties eligible for listing on the National Registry of Historic Places have been demolished and replaced. If the high property values experienced within the city continue, or if land values simply remain at their current level, this pattern of demolition and replacement will almost certainly continue if left solely to market forces. It's, it, it, excuse me, it, it's, I, I, I'm, I'm looking, maybe other people, chapter three, page 322, it, it's a different page from the one that you're referring to. I'm on the draft number three combined PDF that we were sent on December 21st. The bottom in the footer of the document, what is the page number that's listed there? Page 3-4, chapter oh. three, 3-4. Oh, okay. Wait a second. Another key message yes. here is the loss of older homes and business structures yeah. have yeah. changed the face of the community throughout the city. I mean, we, we've had quite a bit of discussion about redevelopment and that there is a need for cities to redevelop. So I, I, I mean, I don't feel like um, the, the face of the community within Rehoboth has been changed as a result of older homes coming down and new homes coming up. I mean, there are lots of reasons why older homes come down and we've talked about that. So I, I just feel like we should revisit these three paragraphs to make sure we all agree on what that messaging should be. But it's related to the architectural piece, Jim, that you also have uh, raised. I, I think those statements are simply the reality. Uh, in my view, the houses have been torn down, they have been replaced, and certainly they have changed the character of the neighborhoods. Pretty straightforward. And the question is, have they changed in the quality of the neighborhood to the negative or to the positive? Right. I'd argue, I'd argue to the positive. I would too. I, and the personal example I have is the house we bought was built in the 1920s, uh, had a leaking roof, has asbestos in it, had lead paint. We had to have hazmat people come in. The uh, uh, the um, quality, the, the electrical system, the HVA system was all outmoded. For us to try to renovate that to keep it uh, current would have cost us a whole lot of money. It still would have been a nightmare. It wouldn't have been environmentally friendly. And so the destruction of that house, I think it uh, improved the neighborhood, improved the value of the houses our neighborhood. And I, all throughout this, I, I, I agree with Rachel too, that rather than saying some believe, it's, it's like all believe, the, the word some, or pronoun some is, is never used. It's it, it, people believe this. So I think we have to be careful because not everyone agrees uh, with what is being stated in the CDC. Well, I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. I mean, because I think the, I mean, I think the character has changed. Um, I, you know, I, um, I mean, there are practical reasons why you know, refitting an old house, it can be problematic, but I mean, I defer to Jim on this, but then, you know, there are, um, there are other issues in terms of um, preservation and there, you know, there could be, um, there could be policies that uh, uh, sort of channel, uh, you know, new construction to, you know, to designs that were, that are more consistent, you know, with the older, um, well, I don't want to say the older designs are necessarily better, but I think there's a, um, I, th I think that there is a lot of um, public support for 
what this third paragraph is talking about in terms of uh, the city's distinct character, um, the uniqueness of the city among resort communities. Um, you know, the, the, I mean, I think, for example, of Lewis and how, you know, many people are drawn to Lewis by, um, by the um, uh, degree and nature of the preservation that has taken place. Some people choose to live there instead of Rehoboth because of that. Um, you know, I, I, you know, perhaps we could, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to, how to, you know, kind of thread this needle. I mean, I have to say that when I read these paragraphs, I, they, they did not bother me at all. You know, I would continue to support this language. I think there's a distinction to be made also in terms of what you're saying, Barry, you bought an old house that was <laughs> falling apart. Um, I had an old ha bought an old house that was falling apart uh, 25 years ago on Norfolk Street, and we did we did a lot of renovations and we expanded it, but it remained a single family home used by uh, my family primarily. Uh, we had some summer rentals, but we were very careful to keep the summer rentals very small and tight, uh, tightly controlled. I think what this is getting at are the investor owned properties where older houses have been torn down, regardless of their architecture, regardless of the state they were in and replaced by homes with seven, eight, nine bedrooms that then turn into basically commercial uses. And you know, that's excuse that's me. That there's, I'm saying there's a distinction between architectural issues and, and looks and scale and character and the use that some of these large homes, the McMansions, if you will, have been put to. And that's one of the things that I think is disturbing people. But let me say one more thing, which is also related to this. Something that has not been addressed yet in this document is, are the results of the surveys that were taken in 2019 by uh, consultants, the former planning commission, and there's, they, the surveys are discussed, they're mentioned, that, that they, they were taken, but nowhere in this document is there any mention of the results. And I think the results of the surveys would show very strongly, overwhelmingly, that those who responded to the survey, whether they were the business community, the visitor community, or the residential community, is very, very concerned about these issues. And that that's something that should be in here also, because it would further support the language that is that we're talking about. Uh, Julie, I, I actually agree with you on that point. I actually, in the very first review we did, brought back a lot of statistics and metrics from those surveys into my comments that have been washed out of this document. And it's actually one of my comments again on the form that we're filling out. I absolutely think we have a lot of data that we can point to to substantiate the comments that we're making in the in the messaging and the and in, in these um, specific sections, and I think we need to bring those back in. Um, and and I, I have to say I disagree with your comment about the McMansions with the with the zoning codes that are in place today. And I recently rebuilt a new home just like Barry did. I mean, you you can't do seven, eight, nine bedrooms. It's just impossible. You have right. such a footprint to work with within the size of your lot that you are confined to a certain square footage and within that square footage, obviously what you can do with it, but you can't get seven, eight and nine bedrooms. Now, could you in the past before the zoning changes occurred? Absolutely, you could, but those zoning changes have been in place now for quite a few years. So I, I, I agree, there was a period where we had some homes that were being you know, built for commercial use and large that people would call McMansions. But today or in the last few years, you for sure cannot do that. Well, we I, I agree, Ray, 100%. And the idea when, I, when, when people say that uh, these houses are being torn down and replaced by seven, eight, nine bedrooms, that's not the case. And again, on page 3-3, three, three, uh, uh, it says, like, it implies, res it implies that the houses are being torn down. They're being torn down to create rental properties. That's just not true. No, some not. are, some are, hmm. but I bet you the majority are not rental houses. I know right around us right now, there are quite a few homes that are being renovated or torn down and rebuilt that are not uh, rentals. So 
it, you know, it, it implies that these the, the people here are tearing houses down to build these big mansions for rentals, and it's just not the case. Some are, but it's not generally the case. And I think that if you read this, uh, the CDP, it implies it all the way through that. You know, we hope it is changing for the worse. You know, you know the uh, sky is falling. Uh, it's it's just not the case. It's not the well, case. Well, no. I I mean, I do think that the there may be something of a lagging indicator issue here. You know, I mean, the the, the I, I'm actually in the process of trying to uh, to renovate my home uh, on Munson Street. So we can all we can all speak from various degrees of experience here, or many of us can. I mean, the the controls that are in place now, I think, have had a good effect. I mean, I think that's what various people are saying. And uh, you know, I noticed in reading the 2010 CDP that uh, you know the the whole issue of uh, many hotels and McMansions was a huge issue. You know, in 2010, it it sort of you know threw out the document, and there's you know, lots of commentary um, uh, to that effect. And it seems to me that, uh, you know, we've got, we've got a success story here to, to tell that, you know, that's that not it's, what this language is saying. I, I agree. No, 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 I understand. But, right. but, I, but I'm suggesting that the, the success story in part is, you know, it, it, it was, it is, is to, um, uh, to enhance uh, and promote the goal of maintaining the general character uh, of these neighborhoods. Um, and so I think it would be, you know, appropriate for the CDP to say, especially if somebody actually goes back and compares this CDP to the previous one, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, uh, the actions that the city took in response to those complaints, uh, as far as I can tell, have been really, you know, have been really pretty successful. And, and so I think that, you know, I think that bears, uh, bears recognition um, uh, in terms of, in terms of, you know, you know, sort of mission accomplished uh, sort of language in terms of, uh, in terms of what the city has been doing. And I do think it's, you know, I do think the issue of design and size, it may be that it may be that what is happening, for example, in this paragraph is a sort of spillover of previous concerns about size and density into the issue of architectural styles. Um, you know, the two obviously it could be conflated. And I, you know, I would just, uh, I'd like to ask Jim, I mean, I think he's the only one of us who's an architect. Um, what, what do you think about that? Well, I, I do think, I was just thinking that we, we probably should take a look at this language. I, I don't think the intent should be to suggest that, you know, Rehoboth Beach is dying because of all of this. Um, uh, and I think we could s say some very positive things about it. So I, I uh, whatever might be conf conflated, uh, yeah. I, I'm not sure. Basically, I agree with those statements, but I'm more than willing to see us uh, soften that language. And, and uh, Nan, as you're saying, you know, point to the successes that we have. I don't know how we get that done, but I yeah, think that... Uh, I could. Uh, Mr. Kaufman, let's let's not talk uh, about each other, please. If someone wants to speak, please raise your hand. And let me know. So it, I, I, I wanted Jim to finish. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm finished. Okay. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, I think there's the distinction here. Uh, the key to this all is, in my mind, whether or not the city ever creates a. Uh, historic preservation piece of legislation. In that, you would identify um, those things that you want to preserve so that you could, you could identify a specific asset that you want to preserve and you wouldn't get caught up in this tear down and rebuild issue. You really just need something that is a piece of legislation that establishes what types of things you want to preserve and how you would do that by identifying that those things. For example, in Lewis, they have a historic district, which they created. Whether we would ever do that or, or not, I don't know. But unless you have 
some historic preservation legislation, this is really not going to make any sort of a difference. Uh, but that shouldn't be confused with the phenomenon of houses being replaced by newer, nicer houses. Uh, that's not a negative, that's a positive. So, you know, I think the key here is whether or not the city wants, or we want to say, the city may want to create some sort of uh, historic preservation legislation. Lauren, do you, oh, Mr. Strange. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I'm going to agree completely with Steve, and I think his observation is very well taken, and we and he's correct. We have gotten two things somewhat mixed together here, um, and I think we probably should readdress that in light of his comments, um, which would be more appropriate uh, in this section, uh, because as Rachel has pointed out, uh, uh, and Julie, it, it's interesting is that we're, we're trying to, to come up with, and I think Steve really clarified it, is how do you change without changing? Uh, and it's difficult, but it can be done. And the historic preservation aspect of it is one that we really, we have never done in the past uh, in Rehoboth Beach. And perhaps it's time in selected sections. Uh, I'm not quite sure how you want to craft that or where we should put it, but I think that would probably address a lot of the issues that have been raised so far uh, without decreasing uh, the importance of what Rehoboth Beach is in terms of its essence compared to the other communities. That's it. Thank you. Nan? Yeah, I would, I would like to say, um, to reemphasize the, the importance of making some distinctions. I think what the, and if you read the, the numbers in the surveys, um, people uh, throughout the surveys repeatedly say, you know, keep the town at a small scale, pedestrian scale, you know, small town scale. I mean, we use these terms throughout. And I think, I think that, that we should use these terms throughout. That's different from whether, you know, structures remain the same and are never replaced. Um, and that's a different set of issues. And, and the architecture, you know, I mean, Lewis does have a historic district. And, you know, it, it seems to me that that district has worked quite well for them. Um, economically as well as in terms of uh, architecture. Um, whether that means Rehoboth should uh, pursue that same thing or should pursue it to the same extent as Lewis, I think is a separate question. Um, and, and so I don't, I don't think we should, you know, I don't think we should, should get those uh, confused. I think we should, should emphasize the positive benefits that have come from the limitations on density and scale that we have, um, and the the concerns that you know, I mean, people, you know, people are expressing concerns, and many of them that that they've had for years, and they may not actually be aware of um, or cognizant of all the changes that have happened. Although the the it seems to me, at least from what I have been able to see in the data that the relative absence of complaints now as composed to 10 or 12 years ago with regard to the many hotels, so to speak, um, it really, really does tell us something. Tom West, do you have proposed solutions so that we can- uh, Mike, uh, Julie is trying to- Sorry, Julie. <clears throat> Let me just point something out because I think it's very relevant. Uh, in chapter eight and in chapter three, community character, in chapter eight, it's on page 8.3 of the individual chapters. Um, it, under goals, we have explored strategies to protect historic and architecturally characteristic structures. We have increased public awareness and appreciation of historic properties and special places. We have strengthened and identified funding sources and incentives for historic preservation. Um, my point being that there are, and then in action items, I think we could expand action items to, to, to meet, um, meet what Steve has said, something in there for action items as opposed to just goals to assess and evaluate, you know, historic preservation uh, 
legislation or creation of a historic preservation zone or whatever. There's nothing in the action item specifically that matches what uh, Steve has talked about, but I do think we've got goals. Well, no, wait a minute, I take that back. But under the action items under the same section, uh, eight point, page 8.4, G, uh, subparagraph G, assess, I thought, knew it was mm -hmm. here, assess feasibility and desire of local historic district designation, historic preservation regulations, and advisory committee creation for historic issues. <laughs> so to some extent, this is already in the document. Maybe, maybe yeah, that would work. Can that be would work. dodged a little, but it's 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 there. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that's not though that we we did kind of breeze through in one of these discussions was the fact that we do have obviously people buying older mm -hmm. homes for the land, right? Taking down those homes and building what they want, but we haven't really offered incentives to try and have those new homeowners think about the the difference or the comparison of if they were to renovate a home they're building on that lot versus putting a new home. And if, and if we are trying to move more towards, you know, this registry of historic places, maybe there's incentives there that we can give homeowners that will continue to upkeep and maintenance and redevelop the current home versus take it down. So it's a thought there, but I mean, we've already heard from Barry. I went through the very same thing. You know, a lot of people that are buying the older homes, it's, it's just not feasible. It's, it's not it's not economically really possible to renovate that house. You really have to start over. Mr. Kaufman. Well, uh, I think Julie makes a good point. But uh, for example, one of the homes I own here was built in 1964. It's a very nice home. And it's really not a teardown at all. It's possible that the city could create some incentives such as tax abatements and other uh, credits and so on for to uh, encourage a new a new owner to uh, not tear the home down but but renovate it um, for example if i ever sold that house i would hope that people would would not tear it down but would keep it and renovate it it's a beautiful little house it has some historic uh, significance because it was owned by one of the original real estate uh, to, uh, uh, people here in the city. Um, but the way things are right now, for example, if that house was sold, and I'm only using it as an example, it would definitely be torn down uh, and a new house would be built. Um, and there are probably a number of other houses like that in the city, which would warrant uh, renovation and retention but we don't have any incentives really that, you know, are of an economic nature, for example. And so I think the, the point that you, that uh, Julie made with the action items is good, but the board of commissioners needs to consider where they want to create, and this again has to be by legislation, uh, some types of economic incentives, uh, for example, abatement of real estate taxes for 10 or 20 years, you know, that, that could make a big difference to a new homeowner. So that's just a thought. Mr. West. Um, I wanted to go back and first of all, I, I guess start at the end. We looked at chapter eight, meaning uh, Ms. Davis looked at chapter eight, the, the action items. If you look in chapter three, three dash 10 specifically, or three dash 11, the top of the page under action items for this community character section, and I think we had talked about a lot of this, these items a couple meetings ago. It does talk in there about incentivizing it mm -hmm. and the economic feasibility of renovating buildings or building to character and scale. So th these are in here. Maybe we need to reiterate them in chapter eight. I think that going back to the first part about uh, that paragraph three, four, in my mind, that's explaining some context and it still maybe warrants rewording to say that in the past, these uh, changes were changing the character of these neighborhoods and something's been done to alter that, but that maybe the surveys are still saying that we need to look at 
design guides that can help with maintaining the pedestrian scale and small town character. So there's, it, it seems like um, that paragraph, the first part's talking about that. The second part talks about what others think about it. So in my mind, it's if you read the whole paragraph, it's it's explaining that some people feel it's changed the character, others feel that the change is important and it's good for a community. Um, I'm not sure how you, if you pull parts of it out, it can, without the other parts, it might be uh, confusing and saying that the CDP is advocating one way. I think it's important to have it in there to explain context for people who want to know how we got to here as long as I think the difference is that's a that's a descriptive paragraph it's not a goal or an action statement and we looked at the goals and action statements they don't you know, I don't think they're saying that the position is that we don't allow teardowns but I just wanted to reiterate that um, or say sometimes that information is important it needs to be worded correctly so it doesn't give uh, impression that what a policy is, but also look at what the the goals, the position, and the action statements are. Um, one of the things, and I'll let Lauren talk about this, I think she's open to all kinds of wording changes, but um, she's really looking for us on this team. If we do think of, of a better way to phrase something better, that reflects the local character, she'd like the specifics of it. Um, we move forward. And the last thing I'll say is putting a planner's hat on. When we talk about the character of an area, um, and we talked about zoning earlier, there's different ways of, to do zoning. Uh, what we use in Rehoboth and most communities use is use-based codes. Um, they call them Euclidean, where you, you have a residential zone or a commercial zone, and you have a list of uses, and you have area and bulk requirements. So those are the one approach. The other approach, and it's already, it is mentioned in that land use chapter we looked at is form-based codes. They're different. They, they talk about not so much the uses, but the form in that area. And they're based on going out and looking at what's the, what's the characteristics, what's the height of the buildings, what's the size, the setbacks, how much, what's the streets like, what types of streets are they? And then the regulations are written around that. I think our whole CDP is talking about perhaps looking at a different way of zoning instead of uses and area in bulk to more of the form so that a residential building is a certain scale and the front door is oriented in certain ways and things like that. Not, it, you can't write good designs that are heavily prescribed, but you write, if you've seen a form-based code and um, Delaware has a guidebook on that that we can send around, it's talking about how you achieve uh, maintaining the residential character. And I'm glad that a few pages later on, there's now descriptions of the various districts. They're not, or neighborhoods, they're not all the like. Uh, that's what a form-based code would do. So all in all, I'm saying that what I want to wrap up with, I think that uh, look at that page 3-10 again or 3-11, make sure it reflects all of the ideas that, good ideas that you just mentioned about incentivizing it and looking at what, how it's important to approach the neighborhood. Um, but there's, you know, it's, there's a lot to consider moving forward with it. Then uh, Tom West and Lauren, um, What's your proposed solution to this? Because it seems like we're running up against a, a timeline problem here and that we have Lawrence looking for some guidance. We have some different views among the, among the planning commission members, although you do seem to have coalesced a little better here during the discussion. So um, what, what would you suggest as a solution? Should we have a drafting consortium, a group of folks who can come up with something hopefully by October 13th. <clears throat> January 13th. <laughs> I have said that consistently. I think I'm still thinking about Halloween and I don't know why. I wish it were October 13th. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> uh, to address your last point about the drafting, I think the language, just using the word some 
rather than like houses are being torn down to be replaced with uh, rentals. Some houses are being torn down. I think that solves it. The other thing on page three, three that I have a, a problem with the with the wording. Uh, it refers to the split personality of Rehoboth Beach. I think it's kind of a derogatory term, and I like to see you know use the word like dichotomy or something else. I mean, split personality is a mental health disease, and I I understand why it's being used, but I just think I think it's uh, to me it's just kind of like fingernails on a chalkboard and I read it. I didn't like it. So I think we need to change that word. Okay. All right. Is did anybody else have a, a thought to that? I mean, that sounds pretty reasonable. Well, I, I would mention that I, and I believe I'm correct that both the 2004 and 2010 TPs have mentioned this, you call it a dichotomy, whatever, but the town within a town, residential versus resort, all of those uh, comparisons but I agree. I don't think the split personality was in either of the prior TD or CDPs. And I think we could probably get rid of that phrase. Lauren, do you have enough guidance here to perhaps uh, come up with something pretty basic, really like Mr. Covington is talking about it and Julie Davis? I think so. Um, I think we can um, get something drafted based on this discussion and um, perhaps circulate that so that, um, uh, you know, you can take another look and, and see if you want it to be refined any, but yes, we can take, we can uh, attempt to do that um, and also make those, uh, the language change that you just noted. Very good. Can we move forward? Uh, I think so. Um, are, are there any other outstanding comments that anyone would like to bring up. I, I, uh, oh, Steve, go ahead. It's your, it's your nickel. <laughs> uh, this is not uh, sig really significant, but it is something. Um, under the uh, action items for, for uh, transportation and infrastructure, in the transportation action item list, you have the consideration of the city uh, constructing and maintaining all sidewalks. I believe that should be in the infrastructure action items, not in the transportation action items. I, I, I just think it should be moved. That's what I'm suggesting. Okay. Um, can I can I just um, uh, make a point about that? Uh, when we when we discussed transportation, we also discussed um, multimodal transportation, which would include uh, pedestrian and bicycle type transportation, whereas the infrastructure section of that chapter is more discussing um, utilities versus transportation infrastructure. So the, the topic of sidewalks and pedestrian connectivity was discussed under the transportation section of that chapter. Okay. okay. Yes, that's fine. Ms. Hunter. Hi. Um, thanks. Um, one of the issues that I've had uh, really since the beginning has been um, with a relative um, lack or, or uh, you know, um, minor coverage, I guess, compared to some other things that seem less relevant of the, uh, the issue of seasonal housing and the, um, the degree of, uh, you know, what what are the vacancy rates? I think that was, uh, I think that still seems a bit confusing uh, because you're talking about a, uh, a, a housing stock that to a large extent is uh, is seasonal, is second home. Um, some of it is rental, some of it isn't. But I, I'm concerned that um, it's depicted in a way that suggests, you, you know, they're uh, there's a problem like with, you know, vacant home, you know, home standing vacant as if it were um, a, a really, uh, uh, you know, economically um, uh, unsuccessful area, which, which it isn't. Um, I'm, and in just in terms of thinking about the document as a planning document for the future, um, there, there are data in here about, for example, traffic patterns and seasonal traffic patterns, um, or, or actually traffic patterns. But I, you know, I, I just want to ask whether 
Uh, some of the sources like the Delaware Population Consortium, as if I remember is one of them and other sorts of state and even county surveys um, don't necessarily take into account the particularities of Rehoboth, um, or, you know, uh, for example, in, in terms of what the, the daily traffic flow is, um, in, you know, in July, uh, rather than, you know, the total amount over the year or, or the average amount. Um, and the, uh, you know, similarly with regard to, you know, uh, the ramifications uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of land use, um, what, what I would call the uh, kind of real occupancy or real vacancy rates are, um, you know, in a town that operates the way uh, Rehoboth operates. So, um, uh, you know, and, and we've, we've spent some time, you know, thinking about, you know, some projections into the future and uh, the fact that the town is largely built out, uh, the size of the population being pretty stable. Um, you know, I, I feel like, I, I wonder if there are data from other sources um, that could be brought into this so that in terms of planning, in terms of thinking about going forward um, with regard to this particular kind of community, um, rather than a lot of data that isn't all that relevant to Rehoboth. Uh, some of it is because you have to have a context and, and the county certainly uh, suggests the context. Um, but uh, whether we could look to other sources of data, I wonder, for example, what the hotel occupancy rates are. Um, and I, I wonder if that might be something that um, some of the local uh, business groups or whatever uh, might have. Um, I know that uh, uh, there are sources of information for the commercial uh, occupancy and that actually is, uh, has been quite good, amazingly so I think given the pandemic. So uh, it, it feels to me like there's a lot of information in here that is of less relevance to Rehoboth and to to us and to the board of commissioners and to the people who will, will replace us um, in terms of thinking about um, uh, policy and planning going forward um, and not enough information about some of the more particular uh, questions for which data do exist, uh, even if not uh, from, you know, from, from these uh, uh, sources that, that have already been mined. So uh, I guess my, uh, my question to, um, to Lauren is, uh, have you thought about uh, trying to secure information from these other sources? And if so, you know, are there, are there problems I'm not aware of? Are there reasons why it's not here? Uh, it, it does the data actually not exist? Um, so, so my concern then really, I would say is not this concern that I have, is not with what so much with what is in the document, although I think there's a lot in the document that's that's not essential, but with what is not in the document. And you know, I don't know if if Tom has any thoughts about you know um, uh, that set of issues. Mr. Covington, did you have your hand up, sir? Barry. Okay, Tom. Um, when I was reviewing it a few times, I looked at some of the sources that we use. The discussions about the demographics, there was discussion of when Sussex County updated their plan, they hired a consultant that from, uh, I forget, I, it was probably the, the source you mentioned, Nan, that they looked at their projections and then they added in, I think it was like 15% in the, in the peak season population to address the fact that the things we get from the Census Bureau don't, can't capture that accurately. So, and, and, and what was done in the, the writing of the Rehoboth plan was to dovetail on that and to say that 
the, we have the official numbers and they're there, but we know at certain times of the year that there's more population. So that part of it's in there. Uh, I don't know if it explains it or, to, or if it's clear enough. I do know that the traffic counts, when Del Dot does counts, uh, they they do them at different times of the season, and Mike could probably weigh in on that too. Of of how when Del Dot recognizes, especially in Eastern Sussex County, that the traffic varies quite significantly throughout the year. So when when we are looking at that, we do take that into account of um, what's what's the traffic like, what what's the demands like at, in July versus October. Or so. Although they're they're getting closer and closer, from my understanding, so I, I do think that's reflected. I also recall, and I don't know, I know that there was a number of comments about looking at the city's um, records for vacancy rates or um, uh, building codes or things like that. And I don't know if if Lawrence spoke, uh, has spoken to. Matt or someone else to look at the permit data to see if we can get additional information on that. The, the one other thing, and I think that the city relies on it somewhat, I've seen it in some of the, the documents is that the, the outfall at different times of the year, they use that to, to, mm -hmm. to determine how many people are in the city at certain times of the year, which I, you know, it's not a conventional way to do it, but I don't know that we do have um, very good handle on some of these details that you're mentioning. I, I work in other communities that have similar problems where there's second home rentals, different times of the year, um, the population changes there. And it's very important to get a good handle on that because you have to deal with services and other things that are in your CDP. So I don't want to, I'll, I'll let Lauren talk, but I do know that there was attempts to put that in here whether or not it's clear enough or is there additional things that we need to do um, that's part of the discussion moving forward? Uh, yes, we, we can um, look to see if there are some other sources um, of, of uh, data that would uh, relate to this discussion. Um, and um, uh, I can uh, coordinate offline with um, with Nan and Tom about those. Um, we, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, we did reference that um, at least with as far as the pandemic uh, was concerned, the commercial vacancy rate or the, the was, um, uh, uh, I believe it was uh, zero. I think, I think it, the, the information that we were provided had it as a um, full occupancy on the commercial side. Um, but yes, we can we can definitely see what additional information um, or other sources uh, could be added. Um, one thing to note, uh, the state, um, as of a few years ago, does require using the information provided by the Delaware Population Consortium. Um, that's that was um, uh, something that was legislated by uh, by the um, uh, by the state. So we do have to. Um, use that and incorporate that. Um, uh, we did include uh, the references, as Tom noted, about um, how, the sus uh, how the county addressed the issue of seasonal population. Um, but then uh, some of the other comments that we, um, that we received from planning commission members was that um, uh, perhaps projections that came out of the, uh, what the state provided were too high. So, you know, we're trying to balance all of these comments that we're getting um, and show the, uh, you know, as, as accurate and uh, consistent data as we can. But yes, we can, we can take another look at some of those areas and see what other sources may, m might make um, the information clearer. Okay, anyone else? Uh, Rachel. You're muted, Rachel. Sorry, thank you. I, I, I do think there's a piece missing here on the messaging around uh, where we're going, right, as a society as a result of COVID and a pandemic, because I think we've all learned that you can work from home and work from home means more flexibility, which means that people that have second homes can come and live in those homes and work from wherever. So I, I do think that there are some 
some I, don't know if I want to call it trends, but certainly some indicators that we need to capture as it relates to, you know, from here, 10 years forward, what does that look like for Rehoboth? And, and I do think that that means that people will be in their homes or per percentage of those people will be in their homes longer um, outside of the, the traditional seasonal um, tourist season here in Rehoboth. And I, I think we need to kind of capture that. I, I, there is data out there for sure around this. I mean, I just did a quick search and there's quite a few articles um, out there around this very topic. So I think we definitely need to build on that because I think it is gonna change the way Rehoboth operates and, and needs to service um, their residents. Okay. Right, Julie, Julie has her hand up again. Yes. <clears throat> I was going to point out that we were talking about this in terms of, of the chapter on housing. <clears throat> But chapter three, community characteristics, has population figures and specifically seasonal population, a discussion of seasonal population on page 3-25. And I think the uh, figures that are in this discussion for seasonal population are way too low. Now they are based on uh, an October 2020 population figures provided by the Delaware Population Consortium. But the principal assumptions apparently are that the season is from June to August. Well, you can argue that one. But the principal assumptions are that the, the, the rental properties will be occupied 80% of the time during the season. And that the size of the group in residence during the summer season has, is assumed to be 3.3 persons. And I know it's anecdotal, but I think anybody who comes to Rehoboth in the summertime the last few years, and I agree with Rachel, we should be looking forward and the effects of the pandemic and people coming to Rehoboth as opposed to flying to Nantucket or the Vineyard or going south. I think we are going to have lots of folks and the idea that these summer rentals have a grand total, an average of 3.3 individuals in those homes when uh, under, the, under the city occupancy limits for rental homes. You have two You have two people to begin with, and then you can have two per each bedroom. Uh, there's no way that 3.3 individuals is, is a valid average uh, for the rental homes during the season. And I know it's anecdotal, but it's true. And as far as the occupancy rate, I don't know about you all, but I have tried to rent houses for family uh, or condominium units in the Henlopen the last couple of summers. And there's not one to be had. Everybody wound up in a hotel out on Route 1. They All the rental properties have been full. Now, I grant you it was in the height of the pandemic, but I agree with Rachel that this is likely to continue. And I have one question, and this is a, it is a question. Is there, why aren't we looking uh, to the city to at least check, and I believe having rented a house, a, a rental license, you have to specify how many bedrooms your rental property has. And if you assume that at least under the city rental ordinance, you have at least two people per bedroom if you are observing the regulations, plus children under six, six and under don't even count and neither does the first two people in. Um, can't we have some, some better figures just based on the histories of rental uh, licenses within the city. And even that's going to be low because we all know that people rent property, the, the uh, real estate companies provide a lot of that information when they uh, pay your pass through the occupancy tax. But a lot of these homes are being rented privately on some of the on websites, Airbnb, VRBO, et cetera. So the figures would still be low, but at least you would have current experience based on city figures in addition to whatever you are required to take from the Delaware Population Consortium. Yeah, I mean, if I could just add to that, I mean, those of us who have rental properties, uh, we're, you know, this is the, the moment in the year when we report our incomes and pay our taxes. Um, and uh, there is a, a you know, significant amount of information just from, from those licensure records, not to mention the fact that, and I know, I know it's reflected in the 
CDP, but I still remain concerned that frankly, some folks, some of us pay our taxes and, and you know, I'm not really sure, you know, how much money that the city is, uh, is foregoing or leaving on the table because the tax collection or the fee collection, uh, both, um, you know, are, aren't, aren't what they could be. Um, just going back to the page 322, you know, I, the, the population which uh, deals with population projections um, uh, and, uh, and the seasonal population projection and uh, I, I appreciate that there's, you know, under state law that the, the DPC numbers have to be uh, incorporated. Um, but the Sussex County seasonal population projection, um, you know, uh, goes, goes up quite uh, substantially, uh, you know, in the, in the years to come. I don't think that that's the case for, this, for the city of Rehoboth. Uh, I, I mean, they're building units like crazy and and outside the city and and we're not on the other hand the fact that the seasonal population in the county is going up as fast as it is is relevant to Rehoboth because it's relevant to all the folks that come to the beach uh who don't live in the city and the folks who come to our restaurants and our stores and and the rest of it but uh, it's it's hard to um to think through that context uh, in terms of the usefulness uh, of of these numbers and how they might be used in terms of of thinking through planning questions for the future. Ms. Marshall. I think another area that we need to address is non-seasonal rental. I, I, um, I do believe there's been absolutely a trend over the last five to 10 years that we're seeing more people come to Rehoboth and rent properties out of season. And I think that is something that we should cite in here in some messaging, just to say that we're, we're seeing not just seasonal rentals, but aside from that growth and continued interest in out of season rentals. And there, again, there's probably data out there as Nan and Julie have already cited that we should grasp from the, from the city. But I, I'm sure that we are on the uptick as it relates to out of season rentals too. <clears throat> And this is so important for planning purposes. I mean, this this really captures what the city should be considering, worrying about dealing with this, the, particularly the seasonal rentals, but any increase in population, the demand on services and facilities, you know, is central to this document. Lauren Good, where are you in all this? Um, I. I as, as stated, I can uh, follow up um, and see if I can get some additional information from the, uh, excuse me, from the city, add some additional clarification and uh, look at some other data sources. Um, and um, we'll just have to go from there and see what, uh, what information is available um, and that we can incorporate. Um, but we will work to do so um, with the uh, with the next draft that you see. Um, and uh, if if we have any clarification questions or things like that, we'll make sure to reach out uh, to make sure that we're um, addressing what was intended. Lauren, I think the good news is that it's January fifth, and the bad news is that it's January fifth. So <laughs> we have a limited number of amount of time. So please, please be diligent. Agreed. Yes. Have we worked through the, the second bullet point on the discussion agenda, outstanding PC comments not yet discussed? Is everyone satisfied that we are, we've done that? Because it, next would be the updated layout uh, following your agenda, Lauren. Yes, um, and I just wanted to briefly bring this to everyone's attention. Um, we, there was a, um, a discussion uh, yesterday about um, wanting to change the layout or format um, to incorporate some more white space, so just generally the, the look of the document, um, but then also to uh, remove some of the uh, tables and uh, figures that are within the current um, narrative chapters and move those to an appendix. Uh, we have 
no one has worked out details of that yet, but this was something that was brought to our attention that was uh, desired. So before we um, took any steps in that, uh, in that direction, we just wanted to bring it to everyone's attention and make sure that um, the entire uh, planning commission uh, felt the same, that those were things that we, um, that we should do. Um, and then if so, um, we'll continue to revi uh, revise those um, and have um, uh, the relocated tables definitely in the next draft, um, but then a, we are intending a um, one representative chapter showing a revised layout to make sure that that is acceptable to everyone. And um, that would be something that would be discussed at the uh, January 20th meeting. Um, and then if that representative chapter is okay, uh, we would um, then make changes, uh, similar changes to the other chapters or incorporate any comments that we hear at that meeting. But before we take any of those actions, we wanted to just make sure that everyone was on board um, with, uh, with those two items. Yes, I, I think the, um, the concern is that, that the CDP draft number three somewhat, and I'm dating myself, somewhat looks like the, an old Sears catalog. It's <laughs> really, it's pretty forbidding in terms of sitting down to read it. And the thought was to put the substantive provisions into the, the CDP with the appendices, including the tables and graphs and other things so that you could sit down and read the substantive issues more quickly than trying to dig through the entire document as it's currently assembled. Yes, Rachel. I, I would agree. If you go back and I, I went looked at the Lewis and the Bethany um, and Dewey uh, CDPs, they're, they're very short, concise and to the point, almost like an executive summary. I, I do feel like this is pretty unwieldy at times when I get into it. But if we're gonna do that, I would also come back to where we started on the whole architectural design piece too, and put that in um, an addendum as well. I mean, we certainly outline, you know, the fact that we uh, should review this and the architectural characteristics and styles, but to go into that level of detail is just, it doesn't seem like it really fits in what the CDP is really meant to be. It's important information if someone wants to, re to, to reference it, but I think it also should go to an addendum if you're going to move some of the charts out as well. Okay, well, we'll have... Uh... Hopefully, Lauren will have something, a representative couple of chapters for us to look at here very soon. All right, Lauren, the next topic, please. All right. Um, so at this point, uh, we, um, as, as many of you know, the, uh, the, while everything is important in the draft, um, the most important items um, that uh, it contains are those listed um, under the, that next section, the review of the, the draft. Uh, so visions, key areas, city positions, goals, and action items. Um, so just for the ease of this uh, discussion, we uh, copied and pasted what was in uh, draft plan three into the memo that you received earlier, uh, just so that you could have it, all of those in one location. Um, but we wanted to uh, basically open it up at this point um, and just make sure that um, what is shown is what was intended based on our earlier discussions or if there were any, um, if there were any additional items that uh, needed tweaking. Uh, we do know that the, um, uh, we are not anticipating your final uh, comments on draft number three until um, end of the day uh, next, uh, uh, next week. So that would be on the, the 13th, but, um, you know, we did want to see if there was anything at this point in any of those areas that, um, you felt warranted some additional discussion, uh, so that, uh, we could, um, you know, make any of those decisions today, uh, and move forward with making some of those revisions, uh, for the next draft. Steve Kaufman. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Um, I have one item. Chapter one, which is the summary. I think the last section, the last sentence in that is a very negative sentence, which basically says that uh, development for development sake is not recommended. 
I think that that sentence should be should be just stricken. I think you can stop the that that uh, uh, right at the end of the previous sentence. Uh, that sentence is a very negative sentence. Uh, I know that what its intent is is that we shouldn't just be developing all over, but I don't think it's necessary with everything else, all the other clarity that we have. And I would just drop that sentence. That's that's the one thing that I was going to suggest. I agree. Anyone else? And Steve, that is on page one dash four, I think, at the top. Yeah, I believe so. I don't have that in front. Yeah, development of additional housing. Me, but I, development. Right. That's that's correct. Okay. Anyone else? Silence is a good thing. <laughs> I, I just, I, I'll just make a general comment. I know we've talked around this and, and we've actually kind of said it, but I, I do think that we should read this document and not feel like it is um, negative. And there are times when I read the, the language and it just feels like the slant is we're going the wrong way. So I just think we need to think that through as we go through this draft and try to uh, look at the positive and the look forward side of what we're doing here because that's really the intent of the CDP. Okay, we are, uh, of course, we do have an October 13th deadline for filing comments, please. October. <laughs> yep. Halloween. Barry Covington. Yes, uh, I have a question. Who wrote this document? <laughs> Oh my, uh, Lauren, I'm, I'm sure it be, all began with the previous consultant and oh. that you were handed a work product that was not finished. I know that to be a fact. Well, uh, yes and no. Um, so as, as you all know, I, I did previously work with the, um, the previous consultant um, and uh, started working on this project before I changed companies. Um, so the the work that the previous consultant did um, started with um, utilizing the 2010 plan as the uh, sort of the starting point and the initial framework. And then that information was updated to reflect um, current or existing conditions, um, trends and whatnot that are going on, et cetera. So then they did, um, you know, work from that, uh, was it 2016 time period through, um, was it October of last year? Um, and then they forwarded us the uh, draft chapters um, that were each, um, each had information in them. So we did have a starting point, uh, but then we, um, added or removed some material, updated, et cetera. So um, it's been sort of a combination of those three, uh, three components. Okay. And then we've reviewed the visions, the positions over the last several meetings, I think, with the Planning Commission. That was, all of these statements were on the PowerPoint show and um, there were discussions and revisions applied to them and they were subsequently revised and we're in version three now. I think that there's been revisions to each of the, these, are, these were these really important parts. So that's why there's been a lot of focus on what's been pulled out and put into this email now. All right, anyone else? Steve Kaufman. I, I think the bottom line is that the document, the body of the document, should be as succinct as possible <clears throat> and as clear and unambiguous as possible. And that the uh, items that are mostly background history should be in an addendum. I mean, you want to be able to pick this document up and read it, and come away with it after you know an hour of really understanding what it says. And so I think the comments that were made today about, you know, tightening it up are very, now I had a discussion with Julie about this on the phone. And I agree with her that, you know, it could have been written substantially 
better. But I don't blame anyone. I think it's just a matter that it was a compilation of many people trying to get to a certain point um, so that we had a document we could we could present. And uh, so now it's time to tighten it up. And I think that uh, all the comments today really go towards that. All right, there seems to be a consensus as to that. That's great. Lauren, what's next? All right, um, let's see here. Um, so the, the last thing is um, really, the last uh, section that we have on that memo is uh, just an overview of some of the, uh, the schedule or next, uh, next steps. Um, so uh, we are asking for um, any written comments uh, from the Planning Commission, the Board of Commissioners, uh, as well as the public, uh, excuse me, uh, by uh, 5 p.m. on January 13th, which is next Thursday. Uh, we will then take um, that evening to finish compiling any comments that we've heard and make some uh, initial recommendations. Um, we, we do have the uh, special the joint special meeting scheduled uh, for the the next day that Friday uh, afternoon at two. So we will get out that uh, uh, compiled uh, comment summary uh, as soon as possible. Uh, but that will likely not be until uh, early uh, the morning that Friday morning, just due to the timing of when um, those <laughs> those events occur. Um, and then. Um, our intent with that joint meeting is to uh, discuss the comments that uh, that have been received, um, particularly any uh, comments that um, need clarification, uh, things of that nature. Um, they will be available for you to see, uh, for you to see all of them. But uh, you know, uh, keeping in mind timing, uh, we want to focus on the ones that really need uh, additional discussion, uh, so that we have a consensus about how to move forward. Um, and we are requesting um, that uh, you know at that meeting that we that we do that we are provided uh, direction about how you want to handle those different items. Um, we are going to work um, then over over the weekend um, and likely that Monday to finish uh, uh, some revisions to the draft uh, to reflect. Uh, or address those comments. Um, not all comments will have um, uh, a, will warrant a change to the text for a variety of reasons, but will, as we did with the comments uh, received um, with the, by the planning, from the planning commission, we'll provide that a summary sheet that details how we've addressed, where they've been addressed or not, et cetera. Um, uh, so we will send that, uh, that revised draft out um, as, soon as, as soon as it's complete. Um, and uh, as mentioned, we will also uh, take one chapter and change to the uh, the new uh, quote unquote representative format um, or the new uh, 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 format or layout uh, so that you can take a look at it and uh, provide feedback on what you like, don't like, what you want to see. Um, then that Thursday, we have a two o'clock special meeting scheduled. Uh, so this, this meeting is very important uh, because this is where we need to, uh, to specifically identify any uh, still outstanding items that we need to address. Um, and uh, again, take a look at that uh, representative format chapter, let us know what you like and don't like. Um, but during this meeting, we are looking for really uh, specific direction on the revisions that you would like to see um, because, um, and, and then following that, um, we would uh, be looking for uh, a recommendation from the Planning Commission to uh, make the revisions that um, have been identified, uh, but then to uh, allow us to submit that revised draft to the state for a plus review and distribute copies of the draft to the county and neighboring municipalities for their review and comment. Um, all of those are requirements, um, are, are legal requirements that have to be done um, in order to uh, meet certification requirements. Uh, so we are planning to submit that uh, those documents to PLUS um, on no later than uh, the February 1st, 
Um, we will have uh, the state agencies will review uh, the documents um, and uh, we'll have a, um, a meeting about that uh, later in February. And then we anticipate having uh, comments back from the state uh, towards the end of March. Uh, and those will be in written format that we will share once we receive them. Uh, but then in the interim, it's been requested that we uh, schedule two additional special meetings uh, that are um, somewhat of a workshop format where the public would be invited to verbalize um, any comments that they have about the plan um, uh, and um, you know, have any of those types of discussion. Uh, we are really hoping that um, uh, as uh, that uh, written comments are provided um, so that you know we can make those revisions uh, as, as soon as possible, um, and that really um, any substantive comments uh, we really need to try to address those before the document, the, the draft document goes to plus for that review. Um, so then, once we get uh, the uh, state's comments back, um, uh, we'll we'll then uh, make uh, some again initial recommendations about how to address those comments, uh, and we will uh, look to schedule some additional meetings, um, an additional meeting, um, uh, or actually um, a, a public hearing, which is required with the planning commission on um, on the the draft. Uh, then we will um, ask for any final revisions that you are looking for based on uh, the uh, uh, responses to the state comments or the county and neighboring municipality comments um, and uh, anything addressing uh, comments we received from the public um, that you would then make a recommendation to um, uh, forward the, the draft to the Board of Commissioners um, with a recommendation um, for its approval. Uh, at that point, the Board of Commissioners, we would uh, introduce the document along with um, an ordinance uh, and then um, follow that up with their review and ultimate uh, adoption. Uh, so those, uh, the last couple of items that we mentioned, we have not settled on specific dates for those yet. Um, and. Um, as you all know, uh, some of the, the dates and times are tentative and subject to change. Um, so we'll make sure to keep the uh, city website updated and everyone on the same page for those. But that's, those are sort of the next steps as we move forward. So just wanted to let everyone know about um, what we're gonna be doing and time frame for that. Uh, so if anybody has any questions um, about any of that, um, uh, if not, um, we just look forward to receiving any additional comments that you may have. Uh, by 5 p.m. on Thursday, January 13th. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, of course, welcome comments earlier, but uh, we're really uh, having a hard uh, deadline for those comments at that point because we will need to be working uh, likely into the wee hours um, <laughs> that, that evening in order to have the um, initial recommendations ready for you to take a look at on Friday. Friday, January 14th. Correct. Yes, uh, Nan, Nan Hunter. You're muted, Nan. Sorry. Um, just a couple of things. Um, one is uh, the issue of um, the public comments, uh, you know, as they come in, uh, as well as our comments as they go in. Uh, I think uh, I just want to make sure that those get posted to a to a website. Um, I understand that would require some coordination, I guess, Lauren, between you and Anne, um, in, in terms of getting those posted. But especially because uh, it, it's a compressed schedule, and so in the interest of uh, just transparency, I think we should make every effort to to have all of those comments posted as they come in. I understand that you, Lauren, are going to be um, providing us with a, a spreadsheet, um, which is great, um, but, but I also think that, um, uh, that it would be more transparent if they were posted as they come in. The, the second thing, the bigger thing, and I, you know, I've, personally, I, I've changed my mind on this, so I confess that this is, 
you know, uh, not was not my first reaction. But my first reaction to the to the um, uh, meetings on February two and March two was positive because I I am concerned about the public uh, having input. But as I thought about the more, and as I thought about the fact that that there will be a formal public hearing um, after the uh, state comments are in and the other municipality comments are in, so that those uh, you know state and and other local comments would be part of what the public has the opportunity to to comment on at the public hearing. And I'm, <clears throat> I'm just frankly concerned that the the um, February 2 and March 2 workshops uh, you know they the comments as I understand would be verbal um, not in writing and I worry that we're, frankly we're just inviting the public to kind of waste their time um, to to come and at a workshop and sort of say what they think and and uh, uh, it, you know uh, it might be repetitive of written comments that are coming in now, which I hope they are coming in now. Um, and, and also then the, the, the opportunity for public comment that will really count as a legal matter will be what happens at the public hearing, at the formal public hearing that's required as a part of the process and that will be recorded and, and um, you know, I assume would have uh, written as well as as oral comments. So, I I find myself wondering really what the point is um, of the February two and the March two meetings. Let me try to explain what what I did when I scheduled those. It's always a process to have time reserved. There, there's always competition among various committees and boards to have meetings now because of COVID obviously virtually. And, and given the way the IT has, has to work to do that, if they do a, one meeting at a time. So I went ahead and placed those on as basically placeholders. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the February meeting I thought was just a good idea just to go ahead and have something that the public can actually see as opposed to write to. March, I really put on as a placeholder because I, I wasn't sure whether we needed that or not. But it's just a tentative, that is a tentative meeting date subject to everybody's approval here. I know that you guys have just been wonderful. This is such a, this is a really demanding process. We had three meetings in December. We will have three meetings in January and, and it, the process goes on. So I, I, I'm very grateful for that. And it's not my intent to overload the process by any means, but would you consider having the February meeting and let's see how that goes. And, and depending on how that goes, the March meeting may not be needed at all. That's my you know, thought process. I, you know, I mean, I, I, I understand that. And I, and I, you know, I, I support what I think the intention is behind the thought process, but uh, you know, the, anything the public or anybody else us or the public or whoever has to say at the February two meeting will be too late to get incorporated into the document that is going to the state or the other municipalities. And it will be comments on a document that will possibly be changed. It may be, I don't know the likelihood of that or how substantially in light of what the state uh, provides back to us in terms of comments, uh, you know, at the plus, um, at the plus session. So, I mean, I. It's up to you guys, really. I just did, as I say, I would had the opportunity to, to reserve some time that I knew would be. Yeah. But I, I just don't want people to be misled. You know, I, you know, I don't want somebody to, to, you know, uh, you know, speak, for example, at a February two meeting and then not be part of the public hearing because they, you know, think, well, I've already spoken or, um, uh, you know, I don't. You know, I I don't have a strong sense of uh, the extent to which anyone is is you know, frankly, that focused on it. But I, that's my concern is 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 that we not mislead anybody. Like John Dewey, um, working with uh, 
larger groups of people in schools and, and trying to get community input to uh, big documents and then running up against timelines. I, I found it challenging to not create uh, unintentionally an expectation that input given would absolutely be considered. And I'm a little bit worried that the way that uh, we're kind of behind the eight ball and considering getting public comment on February 2nd for this document, if we can't also have a pathway for that input to actually be uh, folded into the document in some transparent way, I, I worry uh, that, that, you know, that it complicates matters uh, for us as we continue to deal with the public and, and issues of trust. But I also recognize that there are people out there in the public who want to be able to be a part of this conversation. And I'm struggling with how those two issues get balanced. I don't have an answer for you, Mike, that's clear and, and, and can offer a path forward, but I, I do get Nan's point that we are maybe unintentionally creating a false expectation. Mr. Kaufman. Uh, I have a question on this, um, and I guess it's for Lauren. After the city, uh, after the Board of Commissioners holds their public hearing, if there are suggested changes, would that go back to the plus committee and then uh, for there to look at that and then for final adoption? Because that might be the answer to this issue. Because at the point of a public hearing by the Board of Commissioners, the public comments could be in court suggested changes. So, I mean, what happens if, and supposedly there are some suggested changes that might be, would that go back to PLUS and then come back to the city or how does that work? Um, there is not an easy answer to that question. And I will just say that it depends. Um, any changes that are made that are of a quote unquote substantive nature after the plus agencies review the document um, those half those would likely trigger a new plus review um, now what constitutes a significant change um, one thing is change to the proposed annexation area or future land uses. Those, those have been specifically identified. Others that have um, dramatic impacts, um, you know, those are, are things that, um, that would likely trigger that. So, um, uh, you know, if, if there was a, um, a recommendation that would have really sweeping implications or um, a major departure from what was already contained in the plan. Um, those are things that would likely trigger that, uh, that new review. Um, so one, that's why we are asking for as many comments as possible uh, before that, before the draft goes to plus. Um, as far as a meeting on February 2nd, um, it, if we do hear comments from the public that are that are uh, sub more substantive and are ones that the planning commission would want to see addressed in a draft, we can bring those up during the plus review meeting and make them aware that those comments have been received since the um, since the draft that we sent them. Um, and they can, you know, let us know that, um, you know, you know, go ahead and, you know, it's, it's okay to incorporate those or whatnot. It, it, it really depends on the level of that review. Um, that's not the desired situation. Um, we really want to take care of as, uh, really want to take care of any more substantive comments sooner rather than later. Um, but that being said, there are opportunities to make adjustments to the draft um, throughout this process, uh, both the Planning Commission and the uh, uh, Board of Commissioners will have to hold public hearings 
Um, so, you know, those, those changes, anything that gets identified, uh, we can just bring that back to the state um, and um, hopefully not, nothing would be considered significant, um, but definitely make them aware of it and then, you know, go through that, that process if, if needed. Um, that's not, not the desired way to do it. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of this is, um, it really hinges on the, the, the more compressed schedule. Um, with the, the certification deadline um, and how we need to work to, to meet that, so. Um. Let me suggest one other alternative. Um, if, if the need is to have a, a hearing for the public to speak before the 13th, which is everybody's drop dead day, um, for comments, we could schedule a, a hearing on Tuesday the 11th or Wednesday the 12th, subject to what Ms. Mrs. Uh, Ann Womack has <laughs> for us. Is, is that an alternative that might help? What is the, um, I, I think part of the question is um, what the city's um, policy is as far as um, noticing public hearings, um, their, their detailed requirements for those. Um, and days. I'm. Yeah, I think it's seven days. I think it, it would have the earliest would be the 12th. And that's if we were able to schedule it today. And Ms. Womack, I hope, is on the line and can maybe tell us. Don't we, as don't we want, however, to to? I mean, I I don't oppose that necessarily, but I I do think just for the purpose of uh, you know the logistics and the timeline, it seems to me we want would want to encourage people to submit written uh, comments, at, you know, by the 13th, regardless of whether there's a hearing or not, uh, you know, it. That's been our policy all along that when the, when the third edition was released on December 21st, I think that's exactly what we ask is that the public, public send right. their written comments. So that's been the policy all along. And I, I don't think um, as, a few, as of a few days ago, I think we'd only received one written comment. May I say something, please? Of course. <clears throat> um, I'm strongly in favor of having a meeting where the public can speak up. Either, and if they would submit written comments, that's even better. But to take the temperature of the public out there on the document to date, yes, we've asked for written comments by January 13th, but let's remember we are in the midst of the the pandemic and a state of emergency. It was over the Christmas and New Year's holidays. People aren't necessarily focusing on the CDC right this minute. I think by the time we have two more meetings and we have a joint meeting with the commissioners, not only are people going to be more focused, uh, the public, but also um, there will be, I'm, I'm not sure I see much point in having a hearing on the third draft, which is all that we've got to do, given the discussion this morning, there are going to be changes, both in terms of formatting and certainly in substance based on the discussion that we've just had for the last hour. If you're going to get public comment, I think it ought to be on the document that is going to the plus committee or that has been sent to the, the state for plus review. And that, that, that sort of interim, let the public have find out what they're thinking. Um, I don't want to wait till, till April to find out what the public is thinking. I think we, we need a check-in in the interim. My concern, however, is that I, I'm not, I'm concerned about the February 2nd date, because if you want to get meaningful input on the, the most recent draft, which is going to go to the state on February 1st, February 2nd is not going to give people enough time to look at it. i I would schedule an interim, you know, take their temperature, check in uh, for the middle of February, where people have had some time to look at the plus, the document that went to the plus committee, the revised format, whatever, and get some meaningful, and it, if it isn't meaningful, you know, it's, it's one afternoon, but at least we made the effort to reach out, be more transparent, 
and let the public weigh in on where they are in their thinking. And Julie, I'm trying to, to make sure I understand. Is it your suggestion that we have a meeting in an additional meeting in January or sometime in February? Sometime in February. I don't think that we would accomplish much by having a meeting next week on short notice on draft number three. I think what I would like to hear is have is the comments from the public on the draft that's going for state review. Sometime in February. Sometime in February, not the second, because I think that's too soon after mm -hmm. we get the document to the state. Okay. Well, I would think we certainly can find a date that's available in February. Mr. Dewey. <coughs> You're muted. Muted. You're muted John. He's not muted. Do not unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, Julie, thank you for that uh, suggestion. And uh, that goes a long way to addressing some of the questions I had around public transparency and allowing folks uh, to uh, know that their input was actually going to be able to uh, uh, be considered for part of the document. Uh, Lauren, uh, some of your comments earlier about how uh, that, although it's not ideal, there would be a door open to fold in the, that information after the initial plus review also goes a long way to addressing some of the questions that I had. So thank you for that information. Now, in looking at the schedule, our regular Planning Commission meeting in February is on Friday the 11th. We could certainly just use that meeting as a, as a public comment. Well, does that, does that work? Julie? That would work for me. I mean, that would at least get people 10 days. And by announcing it in advance and telling people that we will post the uh, plus document, if you will, um, on or about February 1st, and you know, they can comment on it during our meeting um, on the 11th. I think that you know, they've gotten notice, the document <coughs> is published, and, and they can weigh in on it, and we can hear what, if anything. I mean, this may be you know, a document that nobody <coughs> is interested in talking about, other than those of us on this screen and the mayor and commissioners, but at least we will have given them an opportunity before the public hearing, because I just think it's too late in the process to have your first real public input in April, given the deadline that we're on in terms of turning things around, incorporating comments, and, and really listening and taking seriously what people say. Let's be, let me suggest this. <clears throat> to make sure they have enough time to review the document that's going to plus, why don't we hold our February 11th meeting on the next Friday on February 18th? That's the commission meeting. Okay, then, then we would do it on the 17th. <laughs> How does everybody's calendar look for that? I'm okay with that. You okay, Steve? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Fine. Mine's good. Mine's strange is good. Rachel? I can make that work. Okay, Jim. Yes. Barry. I can make it work too. And the chair votes I. <laughs> <laughs> February 17th at two o'clock. And I, I'll ask Ms. Womack to make sure that's okay. If, if we had to, if for some reason two o'clock is reserved, can you do it that morning, 10 o'clock? I cannot. Okay. Well then let me talk <laughs> about the 18th. If that doesn't work, I'll circulate a please, you know, respond to me and tell me what does. So I can get a list from her that's available. Send that to you. You can tell me what works and then we'll schedule. Does that work okay? Yes. Good Chair? Idea. Chair? Nan? Uh, I would just um, uh, recommend that we try to set the date for the formal public hearing as far in advance as possible. I understand we don't expect to hear back from the state until the end of March, but if we could try and, um, you know, make that, make that date in April, uh, try to nail that down. We don't have to, to do it online right now, but to give the public the maximum advance notice of when it will be, even if the document hasn't come back from the state yet. Okay. 
Excuse uh, me, Chair. Oh, yes, ma'am. And uh, February 17th. No, no, it would be, um, yes, March. February 17th. Yes. Uh, two o'clock is available. Perfect. Would you please put our name on it? <laughs> I sure will. Okay. All right. So um, just, I'm sorry, just to confirm, then we are not planning to hold meetings on February 2nd or March 2nd. Correct. Okay, thank you. Then, um, Ms. Womack, while I have your attention. Yes. Would you please, <coughs> would you please verify the notice of meetings, the meeting we just had? <laughs> oh, now you want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there were two choices and I didn't like the second one. <laughs> okay, uh, let me pull it up real quick. Okay, the agenda was posted in City Hall and on the City Portal on December 20th, 2021. It was amended on December 29th, reposted the same day <laughs> and amended on January 3rd and reposted the same day. All right. And is any correspondence that we need to? Uh, I have not received any. All right. Is there anything else among the assembled group that we need to, to uh, address? Barry. A uh, question for Lauren. You said uh, for us to submit additional comments. Does that imply what we said orally today? We don't need to repeat ourselves? It would imply that how, although, um, you know, if, if you would like to provide them written comments, um, you know, we are, we love written comments because it, it uh, eliminates any um, uh, okay. inference yeah, on good. our that, part, that, okay, or if good. you have any specific recommendations for language, yes, written okay. would be preferred. And my second point or question is with our joint meeting with the mayor and the city commissioners, Last time we were instructed not to speak and sit there and listen. I assume this time we'll be able to add comments about the CDP and participate. Yes, that, that would be our, our intent um, because of the, uh, be, we, we need to come to a consensus as soon as possible on any issues where there may be conflicting opinions. And I think um, having the, uh, discussions rather than um, a listening session would be um, more helpful than than not. Okay, thank you. And then just as a matter of process, our comment form that we're working through now, do we return that to Lauren and Ann, or is there one person we should return it to to get it posted? Uh, you can send it to, to me, to Lauren, and um, I will, um, we're working on a way to uh, get the comments uh, so they can be posted on the website. Um, but um, yeah, so I can I can collect all of those um, and um, I can coordinate with Anne as needed. Okay. To get them posted. Allison. Just a quick question of Lauren. Um, when is it that we should expect the plus comments, uh, you know, back from them? Um, so there, the meeting is, will be on, uh, let's see, February 23rd, um, mm -hmm. barring any um, uh, weather events or et cetera. Um, after that, they have 20 working days to provide written comments. Uh, so that would be uh, sometime the week of um, March 21st. Um, but it, I, I don't know a specific date that I can give you at this point. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Lauren, is it, would it be possible for planning commissioners and city commissioners um, to watch that meeting, obviously not speak, not have a role, but to, to watch the meeting as it transpires? Um, I, I believe so. Um, and for, for those of you that haven't been through the PLUS process, um, there are there will be several representatives of various state agencies that will provide initial verbal comments. Um, the We, meaning the, the city, would have, um, you know, maybe two or three minutes to give a brief introduction to the, the plan. 
um, and then it really you know goes around a, a table or you know a virtual table um, so that we can hear any questions. Um, usually these are more, um, if there are any more substantive comments um, that they'll let us know as soon as they can um, so that we can um, have the opportunity to ask any questions that we might have um, or, uh, or have a, a dialogue about anything that, um, uh, that, that may warrant it. Um, but really it's our opportunity to hear initial comments from the state. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure that they are going to be holding this virtually just with everything that's going on. Um, I, I can, um, you know, we won't have a, um, the agenda for that won't be posted until uh, sometime in February, um, but we could coordinate um, uh, between the, the groups and uh, the uh, Office of State Planning um, so that that uh, information is available to um, those members that may wish to, uh, to view the meeting. Thank you. Anything else? Steve Kaufman. Uh, yeah, I wanted to uh, I wanted to welcome Luke Matta to our group, and uh, I wonder if we could get this content. I'm sorry, Steve, you broke up. I said I wonder if we could get Luke Matta's contact information. Did you hear me? Yes, I did now. Okay. Yeah. We can either circulate that by email or however, but uh, happy to happy to have you uh, get in contact with me, with me you know, by email or, or cell phone. All right, now I just need the, the, the email. The right. Yeah, we actually right. send it to you, Steve. Yes, I'll be glad to send that to you. Last call. We're adjourned. <laughs>